grab your Bibles tonight, don't that sound good? And turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter number 19. If you're from, hold on y'all, don't everybody stand up yet. If you're from Crown College, I want you to stand up. If you're from Crown, I want you to stand up. Looky here, y'all. Ain't that a blessing? See how many people? Thank you. Girls, I don't want none of y'all even talking to these over here. You hear me? I, will, I, will, I have Brother Clarence's phone number, all right? Dr. Sexton's number, so y'all y'all be seated. And it's a joy to have them. Don't you appreciate young people that give their life to Christ? And uh, so we're glad to have them. Good to have all you here. And uh, thank everybody for praying all night long and praying around the clock. We believe that prayer gets the job done. Amen. Brother Freddie, good to see you. How long of a drive was this for you? Two hours. Two hours. Brother Fred and his wife are dear friends of ours. They're up in the Bristol area. Where, where exactly do you live? What city do you live in? You live in Bristol? Tennessee. Bristol, Tennessee, on the Tennessee line. And him, along with a bunch of other preachers, are in gear and getting ready for that big Bristol crusade coming up starting May the 21st. This weekend, we got a big youth rally going up there where we're going to invest in the lives of those young people in that area. And then on May the 12th, We'll be putting that big gospel tent up. You, you live in Knoxville. We wouldn't mind if a bunch of y'all just bust up there to Knoxville and help us put that tent up. It takes about 200 men to put that tent up. And it's about the size of a football field. So if you could come be a part of that, we sure would appreciate it. I won't give you any money for it, but we will appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, so you all pray. We're looking forward to May the 21st through June the 1st is what it's scheduled to be. And then on that, that Friday night, June the 1st, We'll be having a big youth night there under the tent. And uh, you know, over the past and histories under the tent, we've had literally thousands of young people under that tent during youth nights. So you pray about that and uh, ask God to help us and ask God to give us what we stand in need of. We sure do need revival. Yeah. We sure do need the Lord to help us in this day and hour. And uh, look with me in 1 Kings chapter number 19. 1 Kings chapter number 19. Now you can stand up all over you in honor and reverence for the Word of God. How many of you are glad we have a Bible tonight? Yeah. I'm glad it's a perfect Bible. Yeah. I'm glad it's a preserved Bible. Yeah. I'm glad it's an inerrant, infallible Bible. Yeah. We have God's mind on paper. I'm not looking for a better one to come out. We've got it, honey. Yeah. And I'm thankful for the Word of God tonight. And uh, 1 Kings chapter number 19. I want to say thank you to Pastor Lawson for allowing me to come preach this revival. And I thank God for him and his precious family. And isn't it good to see people that have been faithful over the years? And I sure do appreciate Brother Lawson. First uh, Kings chapter number 19, verse number 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by, one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And, he's lay, and as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. He did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help us now. As we take the next few moments and dive into your word, I pray, Lord, that you'd give us the help and the strength that we need to do what you've called us to do tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. I want you to look with me here as we look into 1 Kings chapter number 19. One of the uh, greatest stories, a, a favorite of mine anyhow, in all the word of God. I love reading about the life of Elijah, a 
man of God that saw the supernatural and the power of God manifested in his life. But inside this, we see the highest of highs and the lowest of lows in how that one chapter we find Elijah. And he says to the prophets of Baal, you say that your God is God. I say that my God is God. He said, I tell you what let's do. Let's put it to the test and let the God that answers by fire, let him be a God. We see him get up and he tells them the whole process and they are to uh, cut the bullock and make the sacrifice and here comes these little G gods of the false, the false prophets of Baal as they come up and they go to dancing around this sacrifice and crying out to this sacrifice and doing all they can and, and we find that Elijah, he was kind of a, a, a smart guy. He, he, he hollers back, he says, I don't know why your God's not responding. Maybe he is asleep. Maybe he is on a journey. Maybe he is here or there. Maybe all these different reasons that Elijah gave and it propped him to a whole new level. They begin to cut themselves. They begin to dance around and holler out to their God. But the Bible said that none responded, that none heard, and nothing happened when the little G gods and the false prophets of Baal came upon the sacrifice that day. When the time was finished and when time reached the end here, Elijah said, all right, boys, if you're done, I'll take my my turn and he says go get some water and pour some water on that sacrifice and they go over there they pour water on the sacrifice and, I, and for no reason could anybody say that Elijah had tricks up his sleeve the, the sacrifice was doused in water and he goes to God and said that they may know that you are the Lord and he prays out to the God of heaven and the God of heaven sent fire from heaven and devoured the sacrifice that day that was upon the the altar. It was such a powerful fire that it licked up the sacrifice. It licked up the wood. It licked up the stone and even the dust that was upon the ground signifying and testifying that our God is a God that answers by fire. Aren't you glad in this day and hour in 2018 that things have not changed but we still have a God that answers by fire. We have the one true God and upon this world, I think I did a study not long ago, nearly 2,000 some different systems of religion around this world. But being a born again child of God and a born again Christian, we have the only religion in the entire world where our founder is alive and well. He is the one true God. And in a day of apostasy, when they say there are many ways to God, they are lying to you and they are not telling the truth. There is one way to God and it's not through Muhammad. It's not through good works. It's not through religion or through the baptistry. But I'm thankful the one way to heaven is through the one true God and that is through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not apologetic about that. I may not be politically correct, but there is one way to heaven. Like it or lump it, it ain't going to matter a lick. The one way to God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. And what a joy to know that out of all this world, you and I have access Says, and we have availability to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and find the one true God of the Bible. Elijah prays down fire from heaven. He goes and, this ain't politically correct, he kills the rest of the false prophets. He don't even block them on social media. He just killed them all. I mean, just killed them all. And goes out there, and old Ahab goes out there and tells Jezebel, don't name your daughter Jezebel. <laughs> tells Jezebel what Elijah has done. And Jezebel comes back in verse number 19. Uh, Jezebel sent messenger and Elijah saying, verse number 2, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. You would think, Isaac, that Elijah would just say, do you know who you're messing with? I just prayed down fire from heaven. After the fire fell, I went up on top of the mountain and prayed on my knees. We'd been in a drought for all these years. I got on my knees and prayed and the rain fell. Do you not know who you're messing with? That's what I wish Elijah would have done. 
And maybe just say, God, zap her. <laughs> Wouldn't it be in control, good to be in control of that? Wouldn't you like to have control of that? Hey, Lord. <laughs> they cut you off at the red like, hey. <laughs> And Elijah, I wish he would have said, don't you know who you're messing with? But here we see insight to Elijah. Instead of saying the things I've said I wish he'd say, Elijah runs in fear for his life. I don't understand that. But it brings great insight to the truth of what it is that we can be spiritual one day and in the flesh the next day. We can be full of faith one day and full of doubt the next day. Yo, yo, I, I'm going to preach to real people. The rest of y'all that's so Christian, you ain't never had a problem. You, you might as well leave. I don't even want your money in the offering later. But for the rest of us that know what it's like to come to church on Sunday and get full of faith and then run from the devil on Monday, I find great encouragement from the life of Elijah where he comes and he runs from his trouble and he runs from his doubt and he runs from his fear and watches Elijah runs and he takes his servant to the edge of his woods and he goes a day's journey back into the wilderness and he finds an old juniper tree and there at the juniper tree directly preceding the greatest season of victory in his life we find Elijah's man as he stands there before that juniper tree and this is what he says to God it is enough in Knoxville language enough is enough Lord I'm ready to die if this is how it's going to be I'm done. Have you ever got tired of fighting? Have you ever got tired of doing right and doing right and doing right and wrong still happen? Elijah comes to a place near that juniper tree where he says enough is enough. It, it is enough. And requested of God that he might die. May I say we do not like these times that Elijah is going through. We do not like those seasons that Elijah is going through. May I say if I was the one designing my life, I would have all roses and happiness and joy and never a season of discouragement. But may I say I believe that God uses these seasons of discouragement to strengthen us and use us in ways that we've never seen or noticed before. And Elijah said, is enough. And with that in mind, I want to preach on this subject. Are you finished? Or will you finish? Are you finished? Are you quitting? Are you giving up a lot? Are you, are you done? Or will you finish the race? I believe it is the perfect will of God. If you're a Christian in this room, raise your hand. I believe it is the perfect will of God for every single one of you to finish the race that you have started. I don't give much attention to how people start anymore. It doesn't take much to start right. Let me tell you what I'm seeing. There's a lack in people that are learning how to finish well. God Give us a burden and a vision and a heart, not just to start well, but to finish well. Number one in our text tonight concerning the story of Elijah, and it is, it is enough uh, finished or are you going to finish? I want you to look, number one, there are lessons that we are learning. There are lessons that we are learning. Verse number four, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And verse number five, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, watch this, now he's done. 
He's at the end of his road. But as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. There are lessons that we are learning in these seasons. And that lesson is God will provide what we need when we need it. I believe that we have a God that knows more about what we need than we know about what we need. Amen. I believe as a father, my little boy Tucker and Siler and Everly, they wake up in the morning and if they had their way, they would go grab the jar of sugar and just down that sugar by themselves. They would drink Coca-Cola for breakfast and for lunch and at midnight before they go to bed, they would eat candy and hard I mean, That's just the way kids are. They, they know what they want, but many times they do not know what they need. And I found out with the people of God much of the time it's the same. We have our desires of what we would like and if we got what we liked all the time we would not be able to stay in this very much longer at all. But I'm glad that when I do not know what I need I have a heavenly Father that knows where I am and He knows what I'm going through and He knows what I need. When Elijah thought he was at the end of his road and when Elijah thought this is enough it's time to quit. God just kill me. We find at that moment when he got to the end of his road that God sent an angel by to take care of him and the angel touched him. Then God, we find here that a a warm cake uh, was on the stove there and water was at his head and then we find the angel touched him again and tucked him into bed and let him rest and get some sleep. May I say that I'm glad that I've got a God that not only knows what I need but he knows how to get it to me. Watch the state that Elijah is in. He's so depressed and he's so discouraged he can't even get up and move and he's there at that juniper tree and he feels like dying and he wakes up that time and out of nowhere there's a little fire and there's a little cake that's cooked. All he's got to do is reach out and grab it and eat it and when he gets thirsty it's over here and he just grabs that water at his head and begins to eat it. How many of you men know what it's like to get your plate and look And your water's all the way over there. (laughs) How many daddies we got in the house? Tucker! (laughs) It's so far away, Brother Lawson. It's just so. It's going to kill me if i got to get up and go that far to get that water. But may I say, when it comes to God, it ain't like that. God knew what Elijah was going through. And God set it right by his head. And at the deepest, darkest moments of Elijah's life, all he had to do was reach over and get the cake and reach back and get the water. Why? Because we have a God that loves us and knows how to take care of us. And when we get to the bottom of our barrel and don't know how to make it, I'm glad that I have a God that knows how to care for his children. How how many could agree that God knows how to take good care of His people? I'm glad He hey, hallelujah, He knows how to take care of His people. He's a God that knows how and when and where and how to provide for His people. He's a comforter. He is a comforter that knows how to take care of his people. Growing up, my grandma, I told y'all a story about her getting saved, one of the meanest women I've ever met, and I won't go into all that. But, but she would tell me, growing up in the coal mines of West Virginia, having them little old shacks of a house that she lived in growing up in, how at times there were such cold winters and in them old houses, especially in the coal mines, them boards was up and the, there were wind drafts that would blow through them old houses. Y'all remember that? I don't remember that, but some of y'all remember that. Then that wind would blow through there and Grandma talked about the nights when the fire with this or that or other and how, how cold and uncomfortable it would get in that house and how times she'd wake up in the middle of shivering and said that her mother many times would come in there on them cold nights like that and Mama would get off that, that, that what they called a comforter in them days and mama would get that comforter and would come to my little old grandma and would get that comforter and go to wrapping it around my grandma and go to hugging it around my grandma and grandma would fall asleep away from the coldness of the world simply because the comforter had been wrapped around her and I remember grandma telling me that story and I couldn't help but think of how many times in life things have got cold and things have got hard and things have got in a rough 
way and got mighty uncomfortable at times, but how many have learned that our God is a God of comfort and He knows how to come when we need Him right in the middle of time and when we feel like we can't make it, how many know what it's like for that heavenly comforter to come where you are and wrap that comforter around you and all of a sudden your circumstances haven't changed, your situation hasn't changed, but with the comforter that is near, as long as I know that Jesus is near me, I can make it through about anything because we have a comforter in the darkness and in the coldness of these days that will meet our needs and meet us where we are. He is a comforter that knows how to meet us where we are. I talked about it some last night, but Becky's been mighty sick over the last year and lived seven days on a morphine pump and went through all these doctors and went through Duke University and all these things. I believe with all my heart it was a demonic, satanic attack against my family. All the doctors baffled, didn't understand what was going on, couldn't explain it, couldn't figure things out. And we, we, we began to pray and we took her to the church and anointed her with oil and did what the Bible said to do if there's any sick among you. And we went through that process and we prayed and all these different things we prayed for. Specifically, we prayed that God would make a connection with somebody that would allow her to get into a high ranking diagnostic hospital that would get Becky some help. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed. The day after we anointed Becky with oil and prayed over her, I got a phone call from a pastor up way up near Raleigh, North Carolina. He called and said, Preacher, I've heard about your wife and I just wanted you to know that me and the church, we have been praying for you all. I said, Hallelujah. Thank you for praying for our family. That's wonderful. He said, I can't make any promises. He said, but I've got a few nurses in my church that work at Duke University. He said, and I'm going to call them and see what they think about this. I, I said, that's wonderful, sir. I sure would appreciate you doing something like that. He said, well, I can't make any promises. It's hard to get into. The doctors that she needs to see have huge, long waiting lists, and there's no promises that we can make. And I said, well, sir, I appreciate any help. And uh, a, little by, a little while went on, and I had had forgotten about most of that conversation, really just pushing it off, thinking that it would never happen and that he would run into a dead end. About a few hours later, I got a phone call from a real dignified sounding lady from Duke University. She said, my name is Miss Nell Price. She said, I'm one of the uh, main assistants of the chief surgeon at Duke University. I said, well, hallelujah, ma'am. And she said, I, she said, I have heard about your wife and I wanted to ask you a couple questions and I thought that was just a follow up from the preacher's conversation and I guess the preacher had called somebody that called somebody that called somebody and finally word got to this lady and she was asking some questions. She said, I, I can't make any promises. She said, but I wanted to ask a few questions about your wife and I wanted to ask some other doctors about it. And he went on and went on and went on. She went on rather. And she said, I'll call you back shortly. I hung the phone up and one hour later, Miss Nail called me. She said, I want to let you know uh, on this date, are you open? Are you free? She said, I've got you this appointment with this doctor and this appointment with this doctor and this. And she said, all these guys have about a six month waiting list but I've squeezed you in and worked you in. She said can you be here in a few days? I said yes ma'am yes ma'am we can be there we can be there I said she, she's pulling all these strings and I said I said ma'am could you please slow down for just a second and tell me why you would work so hard to help me and Becky like this and this phone got real quiet and I could hear her crying on the other end of the phone I'm not talking about somebody working in the janitor department. I'm talking about the chief surgeon's office. She said this, Brother C.T., you was preaching under that tent the night I got saved in Berlin. <laughs> Woo! She said, you was preaching. She said, I came with some friends. I came in my scrubs, came with these stuff on. She said, you got to preaching about Jesus. And I got under conviction. And I got saved. And she said, when I heard what was going on, I felt like God had put me in a position to get you in there where your wife could get some help. They brought Becky in there. They didn't know what was going on. Becky had a kidney stone that was lodged on the inside of her kidney that had been calloused around with skin. And that, that doctor, that, that, that surgeon at Duke University, when he got done, he said, out of the 
level between 1 and 10. He said the difficulty of that surgery was a 10. And he said, I only know of about three doctors in America that could have performed that surgery. Now you can tell me that was a coincidence if you want, but I'm going to tell you that there's a God above the moon, the sun, the stars in the sky that knew where we were and knew what we was going through. And a God, Lord, I'm going to run a lap up in here, a God that knows how to connect the dots. I'm glad that I've got a God that knows what I'm going through and knows what I need and knows what's going on and knows how to take care of His children. Woo! The lesson we are learning that God will provide what we need when we need it. Number two, the limits we are leaving. The limits we are leaving. Elijah says, it is enough. This is all I can do. I'm at the end of my race. How many of you have ever been there before? Today. It is enough. Brother Lawson, I esteem you as a great man of God. But I guarantee if you'd be honest, there's been times when you feel like it's enough. If you'll be honest, some of the oldest Christians to the youngest Christians, if you'll be honest, life has gut punched you so very hard at times when you felt like I cannot go any further than where I am today. But how many of you are glad that it ain't over until God says it's over? The limits we are leaving, God knows that we can go much further than we think we can go. Watch this now. Elijah said, it's done. My journey's over. God said, eat some cake. <laughs> that fixes everything. Can I get a witness? <laughs> so one of them ladies in here, over here, made me a cherry pie tonight. It's in the bus. I'm gonna, i got to preach quick so I can get up that cherry pie. <laughs> cake will fix everything. <laughs> he said, eat some cake. Drink some water. Watch what he said. The journey ahead's too great for you. You know what God was saying? You ain't even close to done yet. There's a whole journey in front of you. And some of you here walked in here tonight discouraged and you, this revival is more than just a meeting because in your mind you might have said, if God doesn't do something for me this week, I think I'm just about done. I don't know that I can put one foot in front of the other, but God is here to remind you tonight that it's not over until God says it's over and there's still a journey that's out in front of you. There's a journey ahead of you and it's too great for you to operate in your power. So God is providing providential blessings for your life to keep Keep you going in the right direction uh, and the limits that we are leaving is that God knows you can go further than you think you can go. Amen. Chris Kyle in his book The Lone Survivor told about the story of him when he entered in the Navy SEALs training camp. I believe they call it Hell Week. It's 200 recruits that come in on this week and it is the beginning process of them going through to become a Navy SEAL. This is a process where out of 200 recruits, usually only 25% of them make it out of this week of training. They say it is one of the most grueling weeks of training in all of military. It's tough, it's cold, it's wet, it's rugged. It is a testing of the will. Mr. Kyle in his book, The Lone Survivor, talks about those beginning days when they get there to this training place. Said when they get there, they're introduced to the staff, the team, the trainers, and said that they are made very clearly without arrogance and without a mean spirit. That on the welcome desk, there is a bell. This bell sits there, and they said, listen to us. Security and protection and safety is of the utmost importance to us. And if this training gets too hard for you, if it gets too rugged for you, if it gets too tough and too hard, at any moment you can come and ring this bell and you'll be greeted with a warm blanket, something to eat, and a warm drink. And you can sit and relax from the training. But basically this bell means I quit. 
And Mr. Kyle talked about those beginning days of the grueling hours when they would go, I believe, five and a half days. Most nights they would only get maybe four hours of sleep and talked about the cold temperatures of the water and training with those huge telephone poles in the sand as they operated and worked at such strenuous environment as those trainers and those instructors were pointing them to their limits and pushing them to the limit and all these things. And Mr. Kyle talked about the absolutely grueling effect as they be treading in this cold water and off in the distance you could hear the bell ringing as people were walking off the training and ringing that bell. Said all day long you would hear moments where that bell would be ringing signifying that somebody else quit and somebody else gave up and somebody else quit the course and just gave up on the things that they were involved in. And Mr. Kyle said even in the middle of the night men would just give up their muscles so fatigued and their muscles so sore couldn't sleep in the middle of the night only to get three and four hours of sleep four days in and they would begin to ring that bell. Nearly 75% of those recruits within that five and a half days would ring that bell. And Mr. Kyle talked about the great temptation of thinking if I just go ring that bell. I can get a warm blanket. I can get something to eat. I can rest and everything will be over with and I can calm down. And he talked about ringing that bell and ringing that bell and ringing that bell. But he talked about it in one of his final chapters of what a joy it was to finish that race and finish that course and not having rung the bell and being a part of that elite system of that little 25% that passed the test that day. And as I read that story, I could not help but think of all Christianity today of how times yes it gets hard and yes it gets weary if you got saved and got a part of the family of church thinking your money is going to get filled your pocket is going to get filled with money and that you're never going to have a problem you have learned by now that that just not is the case it's not an easy battle it's not an easy journey but I begin to think about just in my short amount of time that I've been in ministry how many times I've heard that bell ring as people have given up on God and given up on the church and giving up on the Bible and giving up on their destiny and giving up upon the call of Christ. Listen to me, students. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. And you got to make up your mind. No matter how many people ring the bell, I'm not going to ring the bell. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight, not a game. Run if you want to. Run if you will. I came here to stay. And you got to make up your mind. I will stay. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how cold it gets, no matter who walks away or who stays, I will stay and I will finish. We are living in such a mamsy, pamsy, limp-wristed, lace-wearing generation that just wants to give up and quit every single time that things get hard. Well, the preacher didn't mention me from the pulpit. I, I guess I'm going to go find me another church. Well, I guess everybody don't like me down there. Ain't nobody talking to me at that church. I guess I'm going to go down the road and find me another church. Let me say this. If you get out of this church because your feelings are on your sleeve, you don't deserve to be here in the first place. God give us a generation that won't get their feelings hurt and wear their feelings on their sleeve. Listen to me. This is not a popularity contest. This is not a social club. This is the army of God. And in this day and hour, God give us a generation that will stick in the fight for the cause of Christ. The lessons we are learning. God will provide what we need when we need it. The limits we are leaving. Those instructors in that book made a statement that their training is designed to push those soldiers so they get to the place that when those soldiers graduate that training, they can do 20 times more mentally than what they thought they could do when they started. Because in real war, there is no bell. And I believe if you and I would stick in this fight, when it's all said and done, we could say, I remember when I felt like I was at my end. And when I got to my end, God just kept helping me. I don't want to testify about what I can do. When I'm done, I want to be able to testify about what God did through me. Yes. 
Hallelujah. The lessons we are learning, the limits we are leaving. And then lastly, Baptists are supposed to say amen when you say lastly. <laughs> the legacy that we are leading. Preacher, I begin to think of all the things that Elijah would have missed out on if he would have quit at the juniper tree. What would have happened? What would have transpired if Elijah quits at the juniper tree? There are things that he will miss out on. He goes from there, and remember it was in that that the the earth shook and all, the, all these different things happened and the voice of the Lord was not in them. It was not in them, but it was in the still small voice where Elijah got to discern and recognize and hear the voice of God. Many different things I could preach on tonight, but I got that cherry pie on my mind. <laughs> so let me just jump to it. The legacy that Elijah would leave behind was contingent upon him not quitting at the juniper tree. He has not yet passed his mantle down. He has not yet transferred it to another generation. What is success is after you're gone? What is success if after you're gone everything you did dies? And now Elijah must find a reason not to quit. He gets up and he leaves and he walks off. He hears the voice of God. But look what happens. In this same chapter. I believe it's verse number 19. After he hears the word of God. So he departed thence. And found Elisha the son of Shaphat. Who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he with the twelve. And Elisha passed by him and cast the mantle upon him. I want to say it real simple. Somebody needs what you got. Somebody needs what you got. I'm going to say it till it sinks in. There's a reason for you not to quit. And that is somebody needs what you have. If you quit, somebody will suffer because you were not able to give them what they need to carry on. And God help you now to understand that my race is not just about me. Everybody hear me? I said everything I said and I get to this point. Y'all want y'all to listen. If my race is not just about me. My race about, is about what it affects on the lives of other people. Isaac, I've been knowing you since you're two years old throwing rocks at the little bell at Fairhaven Baptist Church on Camel Street. And my race is not necessarily just about me. You know what I would hate? I would hate for him to get a phone call and say, did you hear about Brother C.T.? He ain't preaching no more. And to know that I would disappoint this young man. I thought about, at this point, the many Bibles I've signed. Last night, there's a bunch of young people walked to that door. Will you sign my Bible? I wanted for them to open their Bible. And I'd already signed it twice. And I said, that's me right there. It must have been a lot to you last time I signed it. Praise God. And I, you know. And I think to myself, I've got too much going on to give up now. <laughs> Sometimes when you get in a mindset to give up and quit, you've got to put it in your mind. The very people who you have to go talk to first. When I was a kid, I remember waking up in the middle of the night. And my mama praying over me. I remember thinking that the roof was leaking. Only to open my eyes. And it was the tears off my mama praying. I'd rather die than have to go to my mama and tell her I quit. All the messages my daddy's preached. I'd rather die than have to tell him I've quit. 
All the sacrifices of the people of God that have made it to help us get to where we are. I'd rather die than throw in the towel and quit. To look at my wife and say, I'm done. The price is too high. Who will suffer because you quit? Help me, Ben, I'm done. I'll tell you one that gets me when it gets real hard. And I, I've learned to practice these things in my mind. Siler's too young to understand much. Everly's too young to understand. But little Tucker is to a different place where he's starting to understand things. He thinks I hung the moon. Mainly because I told him I did. <laughs> Little Tucker, he goes with me all the time, and he's my buddy. I tell this all the time, but it's just too funny. We was at TJ Maxx a while back. Becky's doing her thing, heaven on earth at TJ Maxx, y'all. Amen. I don't even buy her enough for Christmas. I just get her TJ Maxx gift cards. That's the key to her heart right there. <clears throat> we was at TJ Maxx, Becky's shopping, and I got one job, and that's to watch little Tucker. And I turn around and I don't have a clue where he's at. <laughs> over on the side, there's a little section where they got luggage racks where they sell luggage over there. And uh, old Tucker's climbed up on them luggage racks. And there's a section over here where them women are shopping for purses. And Tucker's climbed up to the top rack of that shelf and he's got that finger back like this. Jesus loves you. <laughs> He's just preaching to them women in aisle five. He's just giving them the gospel right there. On aisle. I walked over and I saw him. He caught me by. He went. And went right back to preaching to them girls. Walked in the house the other day and Tucker's over there. Little Everly, my little daughter, she's two years old. And she's trying to sing number 346 out of the red book. My name is in the book of life. Oh, bless it. All she knows is I know. I know, I know, I know, I know. She just giving her best and she say, I know, I know. She just raising them hands up in the air. I look over and little, little Siler going, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He just, I mean, just going at it. And Tucker's over going, woo, woo. He just doing it right in my house. They're having camp meeting right in the middle of my living room. And some people think that's funny. But that's precious to me. Josh, the other night, I was preaching in one of them thrice dead, plucked up by the roots Baptist churches. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Couldn't get nothing out of it. Shouting wise, whatever. I wonder if I had the wonder if I even wanted me there. I took Tucker with me. Tucker's sitting on the front row. I preach the same way to five people or 5,000. Whether you quiet or loud, it don't matter. I'm going to preach the same way. I'm going to have church if ain't nobody has church. Tucker realizes these people's quiet on my daddy. <laughs> Tucker's sitting on the front row watching me preach. And he starts going... <laughs> like, what's wrong with y'all? Tucker had enough of it. He got up, stood on top of the pew and started going, Amen, Daddy. Good preaching, Daddy. Good preaching, Daddy. <laughs> that night we got going down the road, headed home. The truck, Tucker had his little headphones on watching Minions or something on the, on the DVD player. took him headphones off, Brother Freddie. He said, Daddy, you sure did a good job preaching tonight. I said, thank you, son. He said, one of these days, when I get big, I'll be a preacher like you, Daddy. Before I know it, I was swerving through the media, cleaning out the ditches. Tucker put his headphones back on. Before long, he fell asleep. And I got going down the road. And I'll be honest, there's been times I want to quit. Boys, I wish I could tell you that ministry's going to be easy. 
I wish I could tell you everybody's going to love you and everybody's going to like it and everybody's going to get on the same team and everybody's going to be fine. But there's been days I fought through tears and wanted to give up. But I always vision thinking what it would be like for little Tucker to have to tell people what his daddy used to do. Not on my life. I made God a promise if for no other reason but for Tucker's sake and Siler's sake and Everly's sake, I don't want to quit. I don't want to be finished. I want to finish. I read that story of that big to-do Olympic runner that the whole world had their eyes on him. From the time he was a little kid, he ran races. and All the eyes of the Olympic trials, he exceeded in every single level. Won first place in all of them. And the dream of his life was to get to the Olympics and run in the Olympic races. All the cameras were on him. You're all buff. I guess I think it's you I'm talking about. I guess I don't know. He's running in these races and everybody's got their eyes on him. All the cameras are on him. But the thread of the story unfolded the gun went off and those runners began to run around that track began to go on that race far ahead of everybody else there this man ran going around this track winning he came around one corner and slipped and fell people trampled around him and incidentally broke this man's leg in the Olympic race his very first Olympic race Said the crowd wasn't even watching the rest of the runners finishing. All eyes were on this man who the whole world knew was the best. Out of the stands, here comes that boy's daddy. And he goes down there on that track and helps pick that boy up. And is about to carry him to get medical attention. The boy refused. He said, Daddy, help me finish. He said, Daddy, help me finish. And you go YouTube it later. There's video of this man and the father helping that boy around the track. Said the crowd stood to their feet. As that young man and his daddy crossed the finish line. Listen, it was never recorded in Olympic history that that boy won a gold medal. But it was recorded that he finished. There are people in this room, it may never be recorded that you are the greatest Christian in history. But let me tell you what it can be recorded. That you finished. And may it be said of us that in the history of mankind that Brother Josh finished his race. May it be recorded that John Wells, a country preacher from Tennessee, finished his race. Mom, Dad, may it be recorded that your marriage finished, that your home finished, that your kids finished. And for the glory of God, may it be recorded that we finished the race that God. One day, our hope and our prayer is this. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in to the joys of the Lord. I wonder how many Christians tonight will say, Preacher, I want to finish. I don't want to just start right. I want to finish right. I wonder how many teenagers, how many college students, how many people around this room would say, Preacher, I have a desire. I don't want to just start well. I want to finish well. I want Tucker and Siler and Everly one of these days. I hope it's a long time from now. But I want to stand beside my casket. Me gray hairs on my head as my children testify that daddy may not have been the best. He may not have been the smartest. He may not have been the most political. But our daddy finished his race. That's my desire. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's looking around.
As we stand to our feet, I wonder how many people would get out of their seat right now. You say, I don't come to the altar. We'll start tonight. Get out of your seat. Come to this altar and make that declaration to God and say, Lord, I want to finish my race. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Lord, I'm coming to recommit my life. Coming to recommit my stance. I want to finish the race that you've placed before me. Come here, Isaac. Come here. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Just so. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to Put that in the right key for us. The world behind me. The, the cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world. The world behind me. The cross before me. No Though no one join me, still I will follow. Still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior and you have not decided to follow Jesus, I can't think that a better night than to make that decision tonight. I know tonight mainly directed towards saved people, but it might be you're here tonight and you're lost and don't know Christ. It'd be a good night to get born again, wouldn't it, church? We'll give these people time on this altar. Let's sing another verse. Sing the first verse of that. If you need to be saved, you come. We'll take a Bible and help you tonight. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back, the world. treasure that is for your mother's tears to fall on you. Lord have mercy. Did you catch that? 
How many heard that? My. You've been blessed, brother. Preacher for a daddy and a mother that weeps over her children. How many of you out there had a mother and a dad like that? I envy you. May God bless you. That's a marvelous thing. I believe he means it when he says, I'm not going to quit. Amen. We had men 